Um, the purpose of this gathering is to enjoy yet another VCs webinar series. Good morning, Vice Chancellor Professor Santose. Pambiling Pogoto, we look up to you. We feel your warm presence always. Chair of the VCs webinar series. Good morning, Professor Siepe. DVC Institutional Support. Thank you for uh, the support and intellectual energy you constantly share with us. The reason for today's webinar is the author of the books to be presented, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, Professor uh, Mahome Alpheus Masofa. Good morning, Professor, our Dean. Immediate participants in today's webinar and as per the program sequence, Nelson Ratu, Department of English, Advocate E.M. Gorsi, Council Member, National Arts uh, Council, Dr. Akoko Akpome and Professor A.L. Shogane, Deputy Dean Research, Innovation and Internalization. Good morning to all uh, webinar attendees in Yuzulu, in the land and breadth of the African continent and internationally. Colleagues, I hope I have not left anyone out. You're all recognized and welcome. The investor of Zululand is in Africa, and we pride ourselves for being an African university. As we celebrate Africa Month today, the webinar event is both a presentation of books and a discussion of the role of and need for African indigenous knowledge systems in the development of Africa in general and in education of knowledge production in Africa in particular. These are crucial to UNIZULU, which prides itself as a node for um, African thought, and whose students and academics are overwhelmingly uh, African. The books will be discussed in this context and the ways in which they align strongly and promote the goals of the African Union, especially with regards to the African Renaissance and decolonization. The first book is, uh, is a form of autoethnographic creative uh, non-fiction. It details the growing up years of the author in a rural South African setting and highlights the importance of indigenous philosophies, worldviews, cultures, etc., to the information of his identity. The second book appears to be more academic uh, as it is a collection of essays written in a strict scholarly format on African indigenous knowledge systems. The role of the author as a theorist and Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Science is also an important one. 
This is because all over the world and throughout history, scholars in these fields have always played a leading role in formulating and entrenching the ideas that shape education and society. The webinar organizers are keen to project and celebrate the work of Unisuru scholars, not only to the wider university community, but also externally. In this regard, we'll be having more events of this nature this year and beyond. It will therefore be great for CMD to continue to assist in showcasing these webinars to the entire province, nation, and internationally to give UNIZULU positive visibility and recognition. We can say that we have come a long way and that it is time for us to attract attendees and participants from the wider society. And on these notes, colleagues, I would like to call upon our VC, Professor Mdosa, uh, to come to the podium for the opening remarks. Program Director, Dr. Kaili, members of University Management, the special men and special professor of the day, Professor Masoha, deans of faculties, academics and support staff present, students, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this year's celebration of Africa Day a bit of background is necessary. The 25th of May is celebrated as Africa Day, not only in Africa, but also in the diaspora. The day has been set aside to commemorate the founding of Organization of African Unity, OAU, on the 25th May in 1963. The founding of the Organization of African Unity is an expression of a commitment, a covenant entered by Africans and their leaders to free Africa from centuries of colonial subjugation. At the time of the founding of AOU, 32 countries had attained their political independence. This was a major achievement considering that five years earlier, there were only five independent countries. This yearning for freedom has become spiritual, a cultural pilgrimage of sort of for people for African descent. The abiding spirit and driving force behind this global commitment by the people of African descent was best articulated by one of the founding members and Ghana's founding father, Dr. Kwame Nguruma, delivering a seminal address in Africa must unite at the founding of AOU. Nguruma argued, I quote, it has not taken us long to discover that the struggle against colonialism does not end with the attainment of national independence. Independence is only the prelude of a new and more involved struggle for the right to conduct our own economic and social affairs, to construct our society according to our aspirations unhampered by crushing and humiliating neo-colonist controls and interference, close quote. We owe our political independence to those leaders that dare to dream, Guruma continued. African unity is, above all, a political kingdom which can only be gained by political means. The social and economic development of Africa will come only within the political kingdom, not the other way around. The United States of America, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, were political decisions of revolutionary people who they became mighty realities of social power and material wealth. How, except by our united efforts, with the richest and still enslaved parts of our continent be freed from colonial occupation and become available to us for the total development of our continent. Africa Day provides us with the opportunity to celebrate, honor and reflect 
on the historical significance of the commitments that were taken by our four bears. Had it not been their sacrifices, it would have taken long to dismantle the shuttles of colonialism. They planted the seed of revolution that swept throughout the length and the breadth of our beloved continent. But Nkuruma and others observed, Africa has moved from the state of colonialism to a new form of colonialism. These colonies have done a good job to sustain the colonial project by co-opting some of our own to do the order for them. This brings us to the second aspect of the day, Africa Day. Africa Day provides with another opportunity to take stock to reflect on how far we have come. This involves embarking on a situation analysis from which we assign tasks to ourselves. Tasks that are aimed at addressing the unfinished business of the total emancipation of African people. Africa has not lived up to the expectations that Guruma hoped for. Images of Africa unidentified. Notwithstanding our hopes, Africa does not inspire confidence both among its citizens and those outside the continent. For too long, the continent is caused by instability, political violence, economic crisis, military coups, corruption, and health crisis. The continent is currently bedeviled by economic stagnation, persistent food shortages, the burgeoning debt that led to the growing marginalization in the global economy. Global, globally, the continent is a poster of child of poverty and underdevelopment. We are thus presenting with the, with the new task. We are called upon to address perennial issues whose origin can be traced on the crisis of governance and state building. Our challenges have been propounded by the environmental degradation and unprecedented health crisis, malaria, HIV AIDS, the recently the coronavirus pandemic. The onset of COVID-19 has devastated the fledging economies that seem to have been on the upward trend. <clears throat> Job losses continue unabated. Foreign direct investment is still to materialize. Having painted this gloomy picture, bring us back to the inevitable question, what is to be done? The answer is to, is to be found in the questions that we raise and the ideas we propound, what we think we become. It is all about the power of positive thinking. It is about daring the dream. As the founding fathers of the Organization of African Unity did, we dare not fail them, the current and the future generations. It is in keeping with this mission that the University of Zululand has, is positioning itself to becoming a node for African thought. We do that cognizant of our historical and social cultural context, not only at the level of immediate community in which we are located, but also at the wider provincial, national and international context. This brings me to today's event, the presentation of two new books on indigenous knowledge systems by Professor M. A. Masoka, a Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at UNIZU. Professor Masoka's books represent very important contributions to African Renaissance in the fundamental way. As the national IKS policy emphasizes, IKS is vital to the affirmation of African cultural values in the face of forces of globalization, which threaten to undermine, marginalize, and devalue indigenous philosophies and African modes of knowledge production. Research has shown conclusively that contemporary crises of limited development in many parts of Africa can be traced to the negative effects of colonization and adversarial forms of globalization, which it's instituted. The recuperation, refertization, and consolidation of indigenous African modes of knowledge production 
is therefore essential and non-negotiable in, in pursuit of sustainable development across the continent. It is in this context that we can understand the value of the books being presented today, and they provide strong theoretical and practical basis for sustainable research, teaching and learning, and community engagement geared towards development across various academic disciplines. On this note, I congratulate the university as a whole, the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, as well as Professor Masoka himself, as we look forward to the presentation of these two highly important books. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you once again, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. Well thought, well written opening remarks. Uh, at once, I was thinking, wow, am I listening to a political input? <laughs> you know, and there are these tools of analysis that the VC is throwing at us. You know, very interesting. Thank you so much, uh, VC. And we've learned from your opening remarks. You know, I'm writing, uh, as I'm seated there, political independence, revolutionaries and we dare not fail our forebears who have really fought for, the, for us, for us as Africans, and we must just carry the baton and move forward. Hence, that is why we're here today. It shows that we have indeed taken that baton. Uh, on that note, uh, colleagues, I would like to call upon uh, Professor Siepe, who is a DPC Institutional Support and Chair, uh, for the book presentations. Over to you, Professor. Well thought, well crafted, well presented. That's what uh, the product program director says, Dr. Gale. <laughs> And I think uh, we should, we can agree. In the court of public opinion, all that needed to be said has been said. And all that needed to be done has been done by Professor Masoka. So we should be saying amen to that. If I had uh, much respect for theology, I'll be sitting down to say amen and nothing more. <laughs> <laughs> Members of university management, the deans of faculties, deputy vice present, academics and students present, invited guests, and understand that uh, they cover not only this university, but uh, extend to the land and breadth of this continent and the beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, Dubela, good morning. Chinua Achebe, Nigeria's famous author, memorably observed that until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. The import of Professor Mohome Alfius Masoka's uh, two books, Narrative of Culture, Identity and Community, uh, published in 2021, and Studies of Indigenous Knowledge System, published in 2020, give expression to Achebe's exhortation. While the books are a testimony to important milestones in the personal, social, cultural, and intellectual journey of Professor Masoha, who is currently the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Zuland, the books in themselves are, important, are an important contribution to correcting the distortions that often characterize the depiction of African people in what masquerades as history. We are grateful that Professor Masoha 
has had the courage, intellectual courage, and discipline to embark on this journey. This journey began when Professor Mashoka enrolled for his first degree, where he encountered and later joined the intellectual revolution over the discourse of decolonization, epistemology, and hegemony. Professor Masoka's interest in and engagement with decolonization and African thought was deepened by his doctoral study in African orality at the University of the Free State. Professor Masoka was to intensify the focus of decolonization and African thought in his academic career, especially during his stint at the indigenous knowledge system and the education portfolios of the National Research Foundation, uh, which uh, occurred from 2000. His research expertise has since expanded to include research and ethics, knowledge generation, knowledge application, knowledge accounting, as well as knowledge sharing in relation to indigenous knowledge system. He is committed to dynamic interdisciplinary research. This commitment reflects his conviction that the coming together of different disciplines will facilitate the epistemological revolution of decolonization. I couldn't agree more with him. After all, nature and life do not present us with neatly packaged problems. The solution, the solution will invariably not lie in neatly packaged disciplines. Professor Masoka has made important contributions to the interdisciplinarity field of indigenous knowledge system with a demonstrable global impact. There has been growing uptake over the years of the Afrocentric theory of knowledge production, which he had formulated in 2011, which is called the afro perspective, which has been well received. The theory focuses on the involvement of African communities and cultures in the research and development process, and highlights the fact that the research and knowledge production occur in particular, in particular ideological, political, and social frameworks. Most importantly, Professor Masoka's approach is to treat his subject and object of study with respect. It is an important departure from the practice of treating communities as the ignore, ignorant and clueless uh, individuals and people about their environment. In recognition of his contribution to scholarship, Professor Masoka was invited to present this and other works as a keynote speaker in several major international forums, including the Conference of American Education Research Association in Toronto, Canada, and Binghamton University in New York, USA in 2019. His paper at Binghamton was on the theme, the significance of culture, context, and the ways of knowing from pre-K through higher education. He was also invited in 2018 to work with a team of international researchers in Malawi on integrating indigenous knowledge system into social, social emotional support and pedagogical approaches. Since 2016, Professor Masoka has been the president of the International Conference of the Southern African Folklore Society. And he is currently a co-editor of the African Online Scientific Information System book series, which uh, uh, goes by the, the theme, Knowledge Passing, Multi, Inter, and Transdisciplinary in transdisciplinary in social sciences. He is, uh, he was the editor of a reputable theological journal and also international journal of social work. He edited a special issue of the Southern African Journal of Folklore Studies 
and co-edited a book called Timeless Memories, Conversations Between Wallace Oinka and the Uli Bayer, an international project on the Nobel laureate Wallace Oinka. He was an editor for African Online Scientific Information System and serves as a peer reviewer for many journals, including the International so General Social Work, International Journal of Disability, e in the Linga, and Safos. In addition, he has formed and is involved in several national and international networks and collaborator, uh, collaborations as a researcher and academic leader. In Professor Masoka, we find a restless spirit, a spirit that wants to make sure that we also own the narrative. His professional engagement and relationships includes uh, uh, renowned African scholars, such as uh, Professor Kweti Pra, who is a celebrated African scholar in his own right, and Nuffield Fellow and Associate at the Center for African Studies, Cambridge University, and Professor Mulifi Asante, also a renowned world scholar with pioneering research on Afrocentricity and theory of change. Professor Masoka's studies now coming to the book, the books on um, indigenous knowledge system, which was published uh, in 2020, is a collection of revised papers that he has presented in different fora over a period of about two decades. So when you read them, you see the evolution of thought of a person, which adds a bit of a sophistication and a broader understanding as uh, he engages with the key subject. The papers range from overviews of the field, African cultural heritage, African divinity through theology, ritual and intellectual property rights in the context of indigenous knowledge systems in South African universities. The second book, Narrative of Culture, Identity, and Community. Here, Professor Masoka uses aesthetic transfer to create new knowledge in the form of written text. The book offers new ways of understanding the relationship between written and oral traditions. In some of the dramatic narratives, he uses the power of African indigenous knowledge system, such as uh, proverbs, myths, etc., to illustrate that knowledge is transformative and to celebrate the creativity, theorizing, teaching, and learning. The book uh, addresses the indigenous knowledge, orality, culture, identity, and community using the above issues of aesthetics. It blends the scientific with the creative and bridges the gap between the written and oral to refigure approaches to, I will say, not only to refigure Professor Masoka, but also to configure approaches to research and knowledge uh, product, production. It advocates for new approaches that acknowledge African nomothetic knowledge while promoting the transformative power of acknowledging African knowledge context. This is articulated in his afro sensed theory, which calls for the mainstreaming of African knowledge and seeks to make exogenous knowledge accessible and relevant while being respectful of local cultures and context. This in brief, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen tries to capture both the men and his product. And it captures both his commitment to the yearning for the total emancipation of African people. And as the vice chancellor indicated, and as she laid the framework for engagement today, what she was there so saying was to presage or to position the university as a hub of African thought. And, but most importantly, as a program director also uh, expressed it, is that uh, 
the idea of political independence is inadequate, but it's an important privilege to the bigger struggle, the struggle for cultural independence and the cultural emancipation of which uh, Professor Masoha has made his business. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Masoha for having shown me this intellectual courage and making a contribution to what this day was always all about, to make sure that one day Africans will cease being children of a lesser God, mm -hmm. that Africans will see themselves assuming and commanding the heights of every space in the academy and in knowledge production and in the economy. I would like to thank you. Another round of applause. You know, I want to say, phew, you know, really, that is big, that is huge. You know, um, I want to say something, colleagues, that we have the VC in our midst, and she is the one that is responsible for hiring Professor Masoha, for hiring a giant. You know, really uh, uh, making that decision. Bisi, you made the right decision. I, 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 take, take it from me. We are working with giants. You have allowed us to be in the midst of academic giants. You have allowed us to, to harvest you know, knowledge to, to grow from the Masochas. I, it, I'm, 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 I really, I'm, I'm, I'm touched. You know, I want to say amen. And, you know, I see a, a, a lion himself, the restless spirit, as Professor Siabe uh, has, has, has alluded. And often we, we advocate for African philosophies and theories in, in the classroom. And we've often said our students must use African theories. And we have the Masochas and many others. And he has also taught us that you cannot be in the classroom and not actually refer to one of your books. You have to write books, we have to write. Thank you very much. And on, on that note, I don't want to preach, it's not a sermon. Uh, I would like to call upon um, uh, Mr. Nelson uh, Ratau, I hope I'm pronouncing uh, properly, uh, for the book review. Over to you, uh, Mr. Ratau. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is now a really spiritualized um, call. I can feel I can touch uh, that uh, spirituality. Uh, let me observe protocol and acknowledge and greet uh, the Vice Chancellor, Professor Mdosi, and then greet also the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Institutional Support, Professor Siebe, and then greet also the Deputy Vice Chancellor Teaching and Learning, Professor Nomlomo, Greet Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, Research and Innovation, Professor Kunene, and then also greet the man of the moment, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, Professor Masoha. I won't forget uh, the Deputy, uh, Acting Deputy Dean, Research and Internalization, um, Professor Shokani. And then I'll greet our um, guest um, advocate Nkosi, who's joining us through Zoom, we thank technology. Um, and then also, who is a member of Council, National Arts Council. And therefore, greet my championing colleague, uh, organizer, Dr. Abome, who for the past week has given me something to do. And then, uh, and the sole reason why I lost weight, <laughs> writing this review. <laughs>
Um, and I would like to thank him for giving me this honor because he approached me to say, I want you to come and join us and review the book. And I appreciate this honor. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, today actually is Professor Masuha's professorial anniversary. He was inaugurated on the 25th on the 25th of May, 2017, at the University of Venda. On that note, let me say, advancing our own is the first gold standard of advancing African thought. Let me make a disclaimer. I'll not attempt to classify Professor Masoa's narrative of culture, identity, and community in terms of genre or indicate its belonging to any literary school. I would rather talk about it and let whatever I say in this review lead you to the source to read the book so that it may take you to its homeland where it was birthed. Let me make another disclaimer then. And perhaps before that, let me read in Jabulon Derela, who supports my disclaimer. He says that the writing will validate itself in terms of its own primary conventions, in terms of its own imagined complex systems of aesthetics. Another disclaimer. I will not present here a coherent review. I know that Professor Masoa is not a big fan of coherence in writing and, and other things. I will here present a review that has something of both textual and intuitive reading of the book. But first, let me maybe read my own brief uh, bio of Professor Masoa as I know him in his writings and personally as my boss, as my dean. It is important that a brief review of the man his origin, the making of the scholar, the researcher, writer, and thinker, the intellectual agitator, as I would uh, call him, and one of the contemporary custodians of African uh, scholarship, thought, and ideology is served as an index to this review, a lens through which I will temper you to read his book. Mohome Masoha is um, a researcher, an Afrocentric thinker, a patriarchal uh, reformer, and one of the most illustrious and important custodians of thought and the coloniality, particularly through research and indigenous knowledge. And I would like to quote something that I read about him elsewhere, where he said it himself. He said, I was drawn by a deep desire to understand the decoloniality project as served especially by academic thinkers. I therefore come from a philosophical scholarship disposition, which became sharpened by my deep penetration and understanding of the African intellectualism and academicism through having managed the indigenous knowledge systems. Masoa has a unique take, therefore, on knowledge and ways of knowing, and he is ever ready to dish out critical dialogues around the many ways of knowing. One is drawn to his inaugural, inaugural lecture, which he delivered at the University of Venda on the 25th of May, 2017, where after having drafted a paper on Africanism, decoloniality, and indigenous knowledge, which he metaphorically framed, making the fish under, understand its water. It was at this lecture where he meshed with a thought-provoking and agitating model of working with and producing knowledge, the Afrocentric approach. This is a unique departure, actually, for me, from Malificator Asante's Afrocentric idea or theory. Masoa possesses knowledge in research, and in particular, the indigenous knowledge systems. His knowledge is influenced and sharpened by a number of life and work experiences, including, most importantly, his mother. Now, let us come to the book, Narrative of Culture from Mother to Son. That is my affectionate title that I'll use for this book in my review. This book tells multidimensional tales and polemics of a man, a thinker who is deeply steeped in African thought, ideology, philosophy, and the brilliant and enchanting proclivity of expression, storytelling. It is a book that is framed by a celebration of the author's mother, a tribute to her wisdom, and mastery and mystery of life and living. This book is a cauldron of African indigenous knowledge, a celebration and inculcation of those aspects that find their radiance in the African philosophy of Ubuntu. It details through mature short stories and nostalgic anecdotes furnished with subtle serendipity how the author's mother initiated the son into the African thought and beingness at a time he knew nothing about his future positioning in society. This is essentially a storyteller son's book. Perhaps let me quote from the book Overture in page two, which offers an exciting declaration. If it happens, open quote, if it happens that you wonder while you're reading the stories here with what edge my perception is sharpened, 
with what seasoning my language is flavored, and with what magic my preoccupation with expression is enriched. Just know that I had a storyteller for a mother. The edge of her tales haunt my perceptions. Her proverbs and riddles salted and seasoned my language. Mom's proverbs and riddles can solve the whole river. Masoha, page two, 2021. The book relies on and presents both autobiographical and creative material on many levels. The writer offers his personal memories and reflections, his intellectual and professional realization or revelations, if you will, spring from many years of, of work and research in his and his aspiration to bring about what he theorizes elsewhere as the Afrocense approach to epistemological practices, thereby fashioning a paradigm shift to knowledge production. And then he invents tales, parables, and anecdotes in the book. Narratives of culture has what Johnny Clegg in an introduction to his autobiography, Scattering of Africa, 2021, terms a kind of existential archaeology. In a narrative, in this, it is, the book is a narrative that explore, explores many issues, such as indigenous knowledge in its multifaceted ways, captured in narrative that deal with, the, with healing, ritual, initiation. It presents the African philosophy of Ubuntu. It grapples with the notion of community, paints a portrait of the mother figure, it involves childhood as a source and pays tribute to all those influences that make one what they become. It invents myths, utilizes paranormal aspects, it casts before the reader dreams and deal with many other issues, all of which boil down to the writer's main preoccupation, a reimagination of epistemological perspective. At least that is what I have deduced in my reading of the book. The book also explores confines of tradition as far as writing and gender classifications are concerned. It is a vivid and wild page tenor that takes the reader through an epistemological landscape riddled with imaginative experimental notions of knowing and a spiritual landscape, which is the background music to the writer's convictions about his being an identity. This is a book written by men at the height of his powers. It goes beyond ways. It is a book of a thinker, storyteller, who finally has found the time, really, and the space to unbridle tales about all that has, he has collected, observed, learned, and dreamed, and overcome. I cannot think of anyone else who can write such an enchanting, invigorating, forward-moving, and engaging book than Masoha, a figure who has a unique position in academic and cultural life of his film. Narrative of culture from mother to son is rich with paramological aspects, maxims, proverbs, and near aphorismic expressions or sayings. This form a central thread of Masoa's ideological expressions throughout the book. Narratives of culture actually opens with a foregrounding declarative section from which I would like to quote uh, two opening sentences. I am born of great storytellers, oracles and proverbs, weavers of riddles, builders of legends, engineers of myths, chroniclers of the behavior and the history of stars, sky geographers of the path of seasons, the oldest painters, inventors of tales that are both fabulous and profound. I am born of men and women who told stories in enigmatic, elusive ways, in deliberately indirect and direct ways, mostly without method or rubric or a ruler of storytelling. Now I would like to turn for another aspect that I think for me stands out in, in this book. And this has to do with how the author pays tribute to his mother regarding the lessons that she gave him. And I'm reading from a tale, I'm quoting from a tale called Lessons from My Mother, Reflections and Memory. The factors called reflection and memory are not missed in narratives of culture from mother to son. They are actually very philosophical. The reflections border primarily on lessons cleaned from the mother. Here is a passage in that book that I think we should chew on. Open code. But mom did not like bothering other people. Her pride was greater than our poverty. Unless someone offered to help, mom would not ask. She taught us this pride and self-reliance almost daily. 
Let, no, let, not, let not your troubles, your lack, make the sleep of, of others. But if you must borrow, let it be seeds and a plow, and maybe your neighbor's hand in the plowing and the weeding. Even then, you must wash your hands, you must wash your, their hands with a portion of your harvest. But just do not borrow food. Let, let be you who gives, and be proactive in this. Give your neighbor the best, but don't crowd their nest to bother their rest. I see the play of words there. Distilled in the passage is a philosophical multi-layered lesson from a, from a mother to a son regarding her hard work, regarding hard work, self-reliance, and generosity. And in this, I read Ralph Ellison, Ralph uh, Waldo Emerson in his aphorisms on self-reliance. This lesson appears to me to be one of the personal philosophies that drive the writer. Here is another one, open code. Here was a woman who used, who used not raw or force to make you listen, but her tongue heavy laden with natural historical folk knowledge, which she poured into your ears so tenderly and deliciously. Mom was full of funny anecdotes, exciting rituals, bewitching folk songs, and tales about outstanding characters who had lived or were still living in the village. Every story that mom, my mother told expanded and on and magnified the village, the people and their values. It made them almost unreal. This unreality made the village and the people powerful and fabulously beautiful. It made them mythical. And I have learned over the years that this is power, the true gold dust of the human race. Myth is power, the essence of language potency, how realities are born, how perceptions unfold. Myth must be created, shared, protected from many negative manipulation. Close quote. This book elevates memory as an important human capacity and source for creative output and important meditations on some of those issues that make life what it is. Masuha relies greatly on memory in his narratives, and one is left awestruck by the writer's skillfully, skillful manipulation of memory, the marrying of memory and imagination. Memory is a major theme in this book. I would like to now uh, make note on, on Ubuntu, which is the philosophy that frames the book. It's very rich in this book, particularly with regards to hospitality. There is a, there is a story that I want to quote from here. It's called A Night of Bread, where the author speaks about how one night an, an, an invited guest or unannounced guest came to his home and they found that they had so small of a bread, but the family was able to share. And that is Africa or African philosophy of Ubuntu. Let me make note on what we call aesthetic transfer, which I think the writer has really achieved greatly. I've written extensively on this, but I won't read much about it. There is widespread utilization of oral material in written material. This is called aesthetic transfer. Regarding this imaging concept in discourse, narratives or culture, provide a rich case in point. Bodunde uh, offers that current aesthetic practices among black artists indicate a growing interest in the techniques of the oral artists who situate their art in the African social and cosmic setting. And that is the case with Professor Masura's book. Another note that I'll make on some of the concepts that you find in the book is what uh, is called uh, paleomological aspects, which has to deal with how the writer uses proverbs and other folklore items to enrich their writing. I think I'm out of time, but I'm gonna read my summations. I've written so many on this book regarding also intertextuality or the interface between orality and uh, literary. But now let me read on the summations on this book. I will say if the Italian Michelangelo was nest with marble dust, Masura was nest with folk stories and the subtle timeless African philosophies that are a constant unfolding all around us. There are many things to remark upon in this big bang, in this hand grenade of a narrative, not least its brave approach and style to writing and knowledge in which some might have qualms about. It is a disturbing voice to the palace, a phrase Professor Masora liked to use to refer to a person's genius act of disobedience to whatever restrictive powers that may be regarding epistemology and hegemony. The wonder is how Masora managed to formulate tales that carry the weight of all that beauty, all that suffering, all that simplicity, whose elegance brings forth a complex imaginative tradition from which he was made and groomed the gross point of which takes forth homage to his mother. 
thereby weaving a just note of the man's straightforward, straightforward and unbiased feministic uh, stance. Masuha is a feminist. The central narrative of this book, which is culture, is flanked by asides that are polemics coordinated with a style that is raw but sublime. Its flaws are plentiful, but that is not. That is what makes the book an engaging and intellectually exciting read. Its storytelling is wayward, but the luminosity and enchantment of its achievement in, in, in raiding fertile ground for debates and uh, about ways of seeing and makes these objections inconsequential. If you want to know what kind of a book uh, can be written by someone who has survived a sort of an outsider plateau in difficult times in his society and in, in his professional sphere, but who has kept their intellectual and, and creative conscience and their powers of invention alive, quoting Ben Oakley, the narratives of culture answers that question. This is for me, Masua's greatest output, his hammering of revenge against absurdities of the colonial epistemological impositions and edicts of marginalization of narratives of African culture and thought. There is so much I can say. For now, let me thank you. Thank you very much. Please, another round of applause. Thank you very much, Ratao, um, Mr. Ratao. Um, really, um, you have not lost weight for nothing. <laughs> Trust me. You know, I, I, you know, as, as you are articulating, I am imagining you preparing for this review and how you have indulged, you know, the way you have really uh, uh, written and articulated and I'm sure you could go on and on. That is a, a paper that needs to be published, you know, really. Um, colleagues, um, we, we, we gather that uh, uh, Prof. Masoha is very self selfless. Uh, Mr. Ratawa has attested that he's a feminist. And that is why you see what is happening in the, in the, in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. You know uh, how the, the, the faculty is really transforming. You know, a, a faculty will never transform if it is it has if it has a leader that is selfish. You know, that is why we see such a transformation. And thank you so much to that. Uh, having said that, um, colleagues, we are now going to have in response advocate E. M. Corsi who is going to join us um, on Zoom or virtually. And I hope he is now ready. Okay, okay thank you. Okay. Am I audible? Can you please unmute yourself? You cannot hear yourself. Am I fine now? Yes, thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you uh, very much, That's Program Director. Pardon me? Please uh, switch on your camera so that we can see you. We only see your name. Uh, oh, there you are. Thank you. And then adjust your um, screen. My screen. Yeah. A bit more, advocate. Thank you so a bit much. Better now. Yes. Yeah, that is better much. Now. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, now we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, thank you, Program Director. Greetings to the Vice Chancellor and Director of uh, UNUZULU, my alma mater. Uh, the man of the moment, indeed, uh, Professor Masoha, and all the esteemed participants and guests in this important webinar. I'm truly honored to be part to be a participant in this very important webinar. More so that it is taking place on a day that ought to be celebrated and revered by the entire African continent. However, as you all know, that is not the case. We have not yet been given an explanation as to why it was not declared as a holiday in, in our country, South Africa. We are optimistic though that it can still be looked at and the wrongs be corrected while we are still alive. The theme, Advancing African Thought, as evidenced by the writing and publication of these two books, which are actually soul-enriching soul books, challenges us all to think about who we really are and what is the purpose of our existence and how is our relationship with all other creation uh, ought to be. It compels us not just to exist, and accept whatever situation and or environment we find ourselves in without actually interrogating how did we get where we are without asking is this really where we're supposed to be as the african na uh, nation these books when read with understanding they highlight the importance of african indigenous knowledge they remind us about our beautiful culture of Africanism, which is in danger of being deleted by what was initially known as civilization, and now even much more dangerous in a form of globalization. Practices and cultures that are anti-African and that are regressive to us as Black people, particularly Africans, have found ways into our communities and societies, hence the tribal societies and communities we live in now indeed it is quite clear that we have lost our identity because of the new world order that we find ourselves in we hope that our children will sometime we will, will, will at some point find themselves to be who they are yet we as parents and perhaps those that were just before us have themselves not been able to found themselves Maybe they got lost along the way. The loss of our identity has led us to lose and forsake our cultures. And our cultures are the, mere, are the main influence that shape and influence our beautiful way of living as Africans. This is displayed in our proverbs and sayings. For instance, the saying the, or the proverb that says, a child is raised by a village. It was not only a proverb or a saying, but it was a practical way of African living. In an African society or in a genuine and a true African society, there is no orphan. There is no widow. For as long as they are members of the society and members of the community. It was the responsibility of the community at large to ensure and protect the welfare of all the children of the village and the women. Needless to say now, the society we live in, it is often said that our men have become animals. The conduct and the behavior of our men are worse than animals. Women have lost respect for men. That is a clear indication that in this indigenous knowledge must actually be brought back and reinforced. The boys we are raising as families are no longer our, our children. They get influenced from the confused society and they end up with no identity. They end up not, not being able to speak any particular language. They can't speak their 
home language is perfectly. They get frustrated when you speak to them in their African languages. They'll ask you, what does that mean if you just speak to them and you're using simple words? Yet they can't speak English perfectly either. They get influenced from the confused society and they will end up being part of a society that is confused, a society that is directionless, and certainly a society and a nation with no future. It is our responsibility to resolve, to go back to our cultural basics. And how do we do that? It is through reading materials rich in indigenous knowledge that will redirect us back to our cultural basis. to do self-introspection and to resolve to begin to live once more as Africans guided by our heritage. These two books are part and parcel of the material that we need. Uh, Advocate Mkopi, Advocate Mkopi, can you please unmute yourself? You are now muted. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry about and, that. And, and Advocate because there was a bit of a glitch. I think it is uh, the natural. Yeah. Okay. For, Thank for you. Few minutes, we could not hear you. All right. I will. I will. I will continue. Thank you. I've said the, the, this is a call to all of us as Africans to do a self introspection and to resolve to begin to live once more as Africans guided by our heritage. These two books are part and parcel of the material that we need to be, to be our campus. We aim for good values, improved health, good quality of life, and I want to emphasize that. I don't, I don't necessarily mean materially, but improved overall well-being for both individuals and communities. It is our responsibility to shape the society we want to see. Our children and the people in general are not lazy to read. The problem is that they read wrong or poor materials that do not enrich or challenge their thinking. I am reminded of a British philosopher, Bertrand Russell's famous quote that says, open quote, men are born ignorant, not stupid. They are made stupid by education, close quote. This quote indicates to us the importance of the material that we read. The education that you are given sets standards against which we should be measured. And in terms of life, the education and the information that we transmit to our children will not only help us to measure them, but it will also influence the manner in which they become part of the society and how they influence the society. Professor Masoha has done his part. It is left up to us to do our part. And all we need is to read these books ourselves first and spread the word 
to others to read these books. Buy them in bulk. We give them away as, 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 as presents instead of uh, buying chocolates and anything else that will not be enriching people's thinking. We must then become exemplary as to how a culturally rich material can improve our lives as individuals. When we tell people about the importance of indigenous knowledge, we must be able to display to them and explain to them that we are ourselves imbibing on that. But you must not, they must not only hear our words, they must see us living that as a reality. I know that it will not be easy for us to do that. But the sooner we start, the better. I have uh, skimmed and scanned through these books, and I can tell you these are very nice bedtime stories to read. I am committing myself to buy at least five of each and donate to various libraries. Uh, in, in and around the province. I will also encourage other friends to buy and do the same. With these words, I would like to once more express my gratitude for being part of this book uh, presentation, particularly so in the university that is my alma mater. I thank you. Another round of applause for Anara Kate. Thank you so much, Anara Kate. Surely we're not going to buy chocolates anymore. We will buy books as gifts. But we will we, we, attach a, a chocolate just on the side. <laughs> um, just to encourage people to read. Um, thank you very much, uh, Advocate. We have said a mouthful. And yes, uh, civilization and, global, uh, and globalization are threats to Africanism. And I like how he actually, um, be between himself, between Advocate and um, Saratau, how they've tied uh, in the, 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 the spirit of Ubuntu, you know, as, as, as something that is uh, dominating in the, in the books. Uh, colleagues, without, in the interest of time, I know we're enjoying ourselves, and I know there's a lot um, ahead in the day. It's a busy day. Uh, we are now going to have uh, the next item, that is the conversation with the author. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. And uh, the air format, Department of English, is going to have that conversation with author Professor Masoka. We are ready. We are here for you. Let's give another a round of applause. All right. So just gonna go. Thank you very much, Program Director. I'd like to stand on all the protocols, Vice Chancellor, BBCs, colleagues. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. The author. Yes. You now occupy two seats, the dean of the faculty, but you are the author. And today I'd like to see you as the author. <laughs> and I want to challenge you as the author of, of that book. But thank you. And as, as we all have seen, especially from Mr. Atal's presentation, this is a very, it's a complex book. Yes. I hope you agree with you. Yeah, yes, definitely. It's got many parts. Yeah. But there is one part that attracts me the most, and perhaps my five minutes I'll spend yeah. there, and I'll pick you and push you into the part. Yeah. And it's the idea of the story, yeah. of the narrative, in the first place. And colleagues um, uh, who are tuned, we are supposed to be introducing two books, but we are evidently biased towards the 2021 book. I am personally biased to it. Uh, of course, uh, my field is literary studies, so of course I'm interested in narrative. Yes. And I see you start the book with the your first section is titled Note on Storytelling. Yes. Why do you think this is important? You are not you are not a literary studies person. You are not in the Department of English. <laughs> you are not even in the Department of African Languages. You don't teach stories. Yeah. But why are stories so important? to indigenous African knowledge systems. Why are stories important to the whole idea of knowledge and the whole idea of knowledge generation? 
Yes, thank you very much. Let me um, also acknowledge the uh, presence of the Vice Chancellor, uh, Professor Mdoshi, and uh, the DVCs, Professor Seepe, Professor Nomlomo, Professor Kunen, and uh, the Deputy Dean, uh, Professor Bukani, um, and colleagues here, and the colleagues that are actually watching uh, by the virtual platform. I and I think I I made a point that I was raised in a context where stories were celebrated. So every time we had to analyze something, they had to come in the form of a story. And even when you had to be groomed somehow, stories were important. But very interesting, I'm not sure if you have had an opportunity of reading my doctoral thesis. So my supervisor allowed me to write my own story as a first chapter. Wow. Mm -hmm. And by then I was not good because I was battling. And then he said to me, look, for us to be able to practice, let's start by reflecting on your life. Mm -hmm. So he allowed what I call narratology or narrative frames to help me think. And I think if we can um, do that in terms of how we teach our students. And that's what I do now. I do teach honors and uh, a module in honors. And the students that I'm teaching in theory, I start with them in history. I start with the stories. So stories are what defines us. And I think if you follow it up, and I know Vice Chancellor is here, but I tried to push that we should have a, a program on that, but I was never like. And uh, the Vice Chancellor said, no, okay, we can look at it at some other point in time. But maybe we will, but I understand the reasons why, because we need to look at some of the prioritizing which programs to, to take in, in this consideration. But everything is about story. And we cannot run around away from story. And that's why I'm talking about stories. So stories are important. That's fantastic. Of course, I agree. Yes. Well, I assume that they could be called the two one that we are talking about knowledge. And when people talk of knowledge, yeah. what do they talk about? Yeah. How does knowledge relate to yeah. the idea of a narrative or yeah. a story? The problem is when we when we complicate knowledge, as if knowledge is it's an abstract, and whereas knowledge comes from our own um, living experiences. And there's been a very big debate in, in the field of uh, public cases research, uh, whether anecdotes are important as scientific material. So my, I, my idea is that even those that are considered to be anecdotal narratives or material, they should be considered scientific. And, and there's a lot that our students actually bring to our classes which actually can be considered in this case. Yeah. I think, I know that you're looking at one, one of those books, but there's also one chapter that I referred to, a, a very interesting story when I was still doing my master's and I went, was in Mpoko, um, and I was doing research in, the, in, the, in, the, in that village. So I was staying with, with a very elderly lady, but she could not read or write. But what she did, and this is a story that I'm telling, because then I wanted to understand how she was considered as one of the um, midwives. Uh, she was doing midwife. She was actually looking at childbirth and, and stuff like that. But something that actually I couldn't understand how she was able to do it for many years. Then I asked her how she was recording. She used strings. At the time, she had 96 strings. So by tying a string, she will tell you the age of the child, mm -hmm. the age of the mother, the condition of the child when that child was born. Mm -hmm. And she kept that essentially as a recording. Mm -hmm. It was more of a recorder material. She could tell you a story about that. Mm -hmm. So it was up there mm -hmm. in the book mm -hmm. when I was there. So these are some of the things that I think that which are very important that we need to get. Mm -hmm. And I think now that we're based in this school, we're going to get. Um, one of the brief comments made on the book, and he used this expression 
uh, instead of what masquerades as history. Yeah. Especially as African people and our history of colonization, we are aware, aren't we, yeah. of the stories that we're told about us. Yeah. The colonial stories that we're told. Yeah. How explorers many centuries ago came to Africa, went back to Europe, and presented a certain picture that was completely inconsistent with the reality that they encountered, and how that picture has defined, has seemed to define Africa and Africans for many centuries. Yeah. So much so that the, the Congolese, uh, that Congolese philosopher, uh, Mondimbe, yeah. uh, that's the basis of his book, Invention, yeah. how the Africa that is more known is more of an invention rather than in reality. So I think your work actually strikes at the heart of the creation of knowledge yeah. through storytelling. Yeah. So, you know, there's something that makes me excited. Um, it's our our university strategy on the thought for African yes. It's 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 actually a powerful mm -hmm. position that we're taking. But it places a lot of responsibility on us yeah. because basically we are saying we want to define ourselves. Yes. And 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 part of this is actually contributing to that direction that the university is taking. And I for a university to say this is our position. It's 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 a brave, it's a it's a powerful position. And I think we all have to live up to that one. But the only thing that we can do. I can give the world is actually taking our own stories in a classroom in terms of how we research, how we teach, and how we publish. Something which you, you don't have to follow Harvard or Cambridge and so on. And we have it here. So that, that is actually my position in, in terms of saying we must never at all shy away from positioning ourselves. And um, Mr. Rattel knows very well when I talk about the palace. Because when you go into the scholars of the decolonial, when you talk about the colonial term, we talk about a, a deliberate disobedience. And that's exactly the position you're taking. It's, it's, it's very interesting that you say this. And I'm reminded uh, almost every event I've attended with the vice chancellor has spoken. There's something she always says. She, she always says we we recognize ourselves. Yeah. We recognize ourselves as a former group. Yeah. yeah. We do not shy away from it. Yes. And that has been up to the point where this new identity has been embraced and we now express very clearly that we are a university where we want Africans to be advanced. I think that's very powerful. And then you talk of selfless definition. It reminds me of the ways in which again. Colonial narratives, oppressive narratives, attempt to define the other, attempt yeah. to categorize the other. And so now you are talking about the need for us to reclaim our own language, to reclaim our own categorization of ourselves. Yeah. And, and how we can do that. Can you maybe be a bit more specific how we can do that in terms of research? I understand it from the point of view of the charges. Yes. Yeah, but in terms of let's say, because I, I know some colleagues will be thinking, but what does this have to do with, for instance, um, STEM disciplines, mathematics? What does it have to do with technology, for instance, with, with uh, information technology, for instance, uh, which are the current frontiers of, I don't want to say globalized, but let's say international uh, human knowledge technologies. What does this need to define ourselves? How do we translate it? into advancing technological research, mathematical research, and those disciplines that are considered to be less mathematical. Yes, I think the, the key thing here is one is language, which is very difficult, African language, mm -hmm. advancing African languages is actually very important. Mm -hmm. Because when you read this piece, uh, as much as it is written in English, mm -hmm. but I think it reverates this African idiomatic expression. And you can actually hear Zwana or Sibeli in, in the very same text. Mm -hmm. So I think we should not shy away from our own African expressions, it's very important. But also when you're talking about other 
spiritual studies like uh, mathematics and so on. And I, I mean, my colleague, Professor Fagan, he always uh, share, um, um, talks about using our own local data and examples that are around here. We are talking about economics, talking about accounting, now we're talking about the court systems, because um, I mean, the information is just around us, which, which I think we can actually refer to. But this whole idea of saying all these things are somewhere, mm -hmm. um, and that there is actually uh, an American mm -hmm. understanding of science. Mm -hmm. But as I mean, knowledge is knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's the question of how you package it uh, in terms of your own local uh, imperatives. I would call them local imperatives, because they are actually going to assist you in actually making a point going forward in this regard. So that, that is actually where I stand with, with our, our material. Yeah, our material should actually be, be very localized Absolutely. and while at the same time ensuring that quality is there. And I mean, there's no question about the issues about quality. I know that two chapters that we have done with Professor Shukani, uh, because people have been ask, asking us, if you're talking about decolonizing methodologies, mm -hmm. what are you talking about? And then we produced it. And they would not believe it. You go into the grassroots uh, research, which used to be only a wide area, white space. But we're able to, our second chapter there is about this is how we should do it. And now we're having students who are doing sociology, political science at UCT, University of Victoria, University of they are also now referring in the field of social science. That, that, that's fantastic. Um, I, I had a conversation while I was coming to my office with my doctoral student. She's doing work. Uh, she's examining um, recent novels written in English. Yeah. But there's one of the novels where she's uh, trying to she's trying to read the ways in which Zulu masculinity is, yeah. is crafted. And then she is talking about uh, the lifestyle or the concept of the Ubu 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 Nina. Did I say Ubu Nina? Ubu Nina. Something that is certain lifestyle of certain men, Zulu men, uh, associated with certain forms of dressing and certain behaviors. Fortunately, we have an honor student in the office who is Zulu. So now a conversation came up between them. How they are going to get reference? And then I told her, but that's a Zulu man situation. Mm. You, not, you don't expect to find this in a Harvard journal. Yes. The information. So when we are forced, and that's what you are saying, yeah. when we are forced to refer to, to certain forms of knowledge or certain sites of knowledge, yeah. then we, we marginalize and we emasculate our own knowledge resources. And that becomes a huge problem. Yeah. So maybe you can say something a little bit about this, no. because our, our, our people tend to think if you've not cited a Taylor and Francis journal, if this journal, if the material, the information is not coming from that side, then it's not valid, then it's not to be respected, it's not to be accepted. I agree with you. I, I think we should, if we start by respecting our own material, other people will respect us. Absolutely. But the problem is, and I think because that's the thing to say all the time. I mean, if every time you teach, you, you don't refer to your own work, I mean, and, and you can't command your knowledge mm -hmm. and respect from your students. Mm -hmm. So it's important that we encourage, and I think we are on the right to ensure that colleagues start publishing and gaining confidence in terms of what they are writing about, mm -hmm. what they're publishing. But as I said, we have a unique context being at the University of Buda around here. There's a lot which other universities don't have, which we can use to offer to the world. We have a lot. Mm, that's we that's are that. now doing, um, and I know by Cynthia is uh, still wanting us to finalize a book on, um, on COVID. Besides that uh, research that we are being supported on, but we are getting a lot of material which is coming now. Which is going to be unique in terms of how communities around here understand COVID. And interesting stuff that is coming up. Yes. But it's something that is very unique around here. You can't find it in, yeah, maybe in Soweto, you'll never even find it in Soweto or Pretoria and so on. 
So we do have a, a, a unique situation and we have an opportunity there. Nothing um research opportunities are there for our colleagues and our students. And I think that challenges us also in terms of our, our next level of uh, scholars and researchers in terms of the PhDs and masters when we read in terms of saying what are what are they researching about? One of the things that I'm actually very interested in in the next few years is to check the kind of research which our students are doing mm -hmm. in social science. If you're talking about social science at the University of Europe, then we'll be saying what kind of research is going on there. Then, then Professor Taylor will be looking at that, Professor Ndombella, and then of course Professor Lefranya will be looking at other things. So, so that we are saying the impact we are making. But all, not only in terms of that, and I know Professor Nolan talks about the scholarship of teaching and learning, which is now also coming up now. Because now that is the question of saying the kind of uh, graduate who lives in the school of learning. It's fantastic stuff. And uh, that is why um, if we are asked, and I know you tried to raise this point a bit, the build up to this uh, yeah. presentation, and I just want to let out a little secret to the to the, the same <laughs> um, we we determine we who organize the webinars determines that we we'll celebrate our team, we we'll celebrate our colleague, we we'll celebrate a knowledge field. Mm -hmm. uh, happening, it was at the final moment that I realized that it coincides with his uh, professoral uh, uh, inaugural address. Uh, and he was, uh, contrary to what people might think, uh, Prof. Masoka can be very humble and very modest. He was like, no, no, I said, no, but Prof, no. Um, if we are going to celebrate knowledge creation, there's no reason why we should celebrate our own. Yeah. Moreover, the dean before you did that, so it's yeah. not really something new. Uh, yeah. And we intend also to celebrate other colleagues mm -hmm. who have produced work. But uh, I want to thank you for leading from the front in this regard, for being proud of your role. Because I promise you, perhaps if you have not shown ownership of this work, yeah. Perhaps we will not be motivated. Yes. Yes. But you do show ownership. You do not spare an opportunity to talk about Afrocent theory, right. which is the next question I'm going to ask. Perhaps the last one. Yes. Uh, is that fine? Should be the last one? The program director. Uh, you just talked to us briefly about Afrocent uh, theory. But before then, while I thank you and congratulate you and thank you for the inspiration you have produced, uh, as dean, very busy, but always publishing. Uh, Still, something I'm trying to understand. Uh, maybe we need to go to the Pompo or then that. That's very interesting. But what I find the most attractive about this book is what Mr. Ratao referred to as incoherence. Yeah. The way you defy, the way you defy conventions of writing. And maybe it's in that idea of the state transfer. Yeah. The way you even use the English language uh, with scant respect for the those who call it their own. Uh, uh, it's something actually you say when they had that debate between him and okay. Yongo, whether the people should write African languages of English. Actually, said, don't worry, we'll use English, but the way we will use this English, even English itself, not <laughs> recognize itself. <laughs> And you have done so, but in so doing, I think your work demonstrates the imagine the role of imagination for in the creation of knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah. As recipients of knowledge from, from the global north, we we are given the impression that once they say this, that's what it is. It's like a divine revelation. God the Father, God the Son was there, and it's incontrovertible. But your work has shown. That imagination, after all, it's called knowledge creation. Yeah. It's a creative and imaginative process. Yeah. And the boldness with which you do that, I think, is fantastic. I really congratulate you for that. I intend, I intend as a good literary study scholar, and you can see Nelson demonstrating part of it, you know, may a living out of writing on what other people have been. Yeah, sure. yeah. so I intend to have at least that. <laughs> but now tell us, I said, simply as possible. How the Afrocent notion idea works yeah. in maybe in research, you can limit yourself to one aspect, maybe teaching and learning, 
Uh, I would like you, if you can specify to my discipline, I'll be very happy for applying the yes, I must say, um, I hope my 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 true is behaving now. I thought I was going to cope a lot. Yeah, um, <laughs> I had a, a conversation with uh, Professor Asante. I think it's about seven years ago, and we were in a conference, and he presented a very interesting paper. But then I had a feeling that scholars in Afrocentric uh, or Afrocentricity are a little bit arrogant. And that is the way that is the story that I'm underlining that, like in saying this is us, because it, it actually came to, if you go to West Africa, where I, I'm not sure you're comfortable, you know the concept of Lega. They just give you a more movement of saying, you know, come here and fight us. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's us and nothing else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then I had a conversation with Professor Sam saying, hey, I, I, I'm, I'm coming from a background of Latin and Greek. Because I have a master in, 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 in Greek. So I was teaching Greek and Latin. They are from classics. And also classical civilization at the Mesa. So, so I did it at a master's level. So I can read it in Latin at the master's level. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was teaching in terms of my oral studies. Mm -hmm. So I said, I can't deny the influence of Western um, and epistemology on me. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I still remain happy. Mm -hmm. But now, if I have to follow up with interest, then it means this element is hard and is own value, and that gives me a problem. Mm -hmm. And it won't be me. Mm -hmm. So I would rather settle for an Afro sense. Mm -hmm. Afro sense basically means I am an African. Mm -hmm. And this is how I see things from my point of view. And whatever engages with me must sense my position as an African. Wow. If it doesn't talk to my sense as an African, therefore it will not be. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it is definitely different from what Sante is saying. Mm -hmm. And what and Asante agrees with me. Oh, yeah. But then Asante wanted us to work together on it. But I said to him, but we won't agree. <laughs> So all of my work has always been on Afro sense. I think if you read my all my my publications, mm -hmm. I'm not referring to Afro sense. Mm -hmm. I am talking about Afro sense. Mm -hmm. So I'm an Afro sense scholar and not an Afro sense scholar. Mm -hmm. Although I could argue with you on that, please. Yeah. I could say, <laughs> but I thank you very much for that explanation. I could say the Afro sense perspective is a form of Afro centricity. Which does not deny the influences on Africans from outside Africa. Will Will Asante agree with you? I doubt. That's the point. Because yeah. I, I think Ali Matsuri, it's either Ali Matsuri or Mahmoud Mandani, who says Africans must accept the fact that we have heritage from other parts of the world. We yeah. are not an isolated, we didn't yeah. drop from the sky. Yeah. I, yeah. That's the same applies to me. I, I can't run away from. From the, I mean, it's, it's like when you are some academics, especially in the field of African studies, mm -hmm. when you talk about you need a Christian, they run away from it. Mm -hmm. You don't want to say it and say mm -hmm. you will be judged. Mm -hmm. But I can't run away from it because yes. I'm a Christian. Yes. Mm -hmm. And and, and therefore I can't. Yes. It's, it's me. And that's how I trained. Yes. But I, I cannot demonize it now mm -hmm. because now people are talking about decolonization. Mm -hmm. So that's that's me. Yeah. That's very fantastic. Well, first of all, it's been a pleasure working with you. Yeah. Uh, to share also with you as a colleague yeah. and having this conversation with you. Yeah. Great pleasure. Let's just so thank the university. Yes, yes. I have to because I, um, I remember in 2019 BC when I started, it was very difficult. I remember the the former BC teaching and learning. He was very clear to me. He said to me, "Look, during the week, no research." So you do research during weekends, but it was not a real bad way because there, 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 there was a lot of work to be done. But what I liked was that weekends gave me a chance to do research. So then I'll use my own research funds to go and do this. Yeah. And um, that actually has helped me. And basically that is the reason why 
you see some of the articles mm -hmm. coming through, but also wanted to thank the university for for the for the opportunity because um they would also encourage besides being the job that I do is more administrative, but I'm also having some time to do research, which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. And that it's 4 a.m. in the morning and <laughs> Thank you very much. A round of applause. Well deserved. Well deserved. You know, if Harvard was a person, you know, really, <laughs> they are in trouble. <laughs> because really, we're not prepared to take anything from them anymore. We are now upper sensed. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for that conversation. Um, Professor Masofa and uh, Dr. Akome. Uh, colleagues, um, it is now the questions and answer session. Um, I, I think one is just to go to the chat quickly. I, would, I was, we won't spend much time uh, because I, I was just reading on the, on the, on the board, uh, colleagues wanting to get a chance. Um, Okay, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, I saw one which, uh, when, when one colleague was asking about uh, where to get these books. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, all the accolades that are coming in. And uh, we wanted to get the presentation on screen, okay. Congratulating uh, Professor Masofa Halalapo. And um, congratulations on the books that are so important in continuing uh, this course. On Africanization, decolonization, etc., we are inspired indeed. Thank you, uh, Dean and Prof. Siepe. What a defining moment. Congrats, Prof. Masoha. Uh, I won't read all of them, colleagues, in the interest of time. Um, so it's just congratulatory uh, uh, remarks uh, from colleagues. Uh, where do we get these books? I've said that. Um, okay. I think uh, uh, colleagues uh, that have been on the chat, uh, we see your 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 your, uh, your comments. Thank you very much. Uh, it's it's not been a waste of time, um, it, but because of, of of the time factor, we have to continue. And on that note, um, I would like to call Professor Shokane uh, to come on the podium for the vote of thanks. Professor Shokane. Um, good. Uh, then it's still morning. Good morning. Yes, I've been saying we are early. Good morning. Good morning. Um, everyone. Uh, it has been such an honor and a privilege to be part of this wonderful webinar the Vice Chancellor's webinar series, um, Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences 2022, specifically for the Africa Man. Um, on behalf of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to our Vice Chancellor, Professor Mdose, our pillar for your, and for your leadership. You remain true to your vision, for, de for developing the distinctiveness of Inuzulu as an African university. Um, I had like now, especially uh, working with the colleagues from literature, they like quotes. <laughs> um, like Sir Winston Churchill says, the price of greatness is responsibility. You remain true, you're responsible. We having this, um, Faculty webinar hosted by you, and we are here in person. We really appreciate that. Um, Professor Siente, our DVC for institutional support, we know this cannot happen without you. <laughs> we send you emails anytime, you respond, you say, go for it. We really appreciate you. And for today's, especially for bringing forth the, uh, uh, the book presentation. 
And I know how you love scholarship. You know how you love us to pursue advancing knowledge. Um, also our DGC research, Professor Bukhane, it's evident you can see that we are really striving and we thank you for your support that will assist us to continue down the growth for research and innovation. Professor Nomlomo, um, for teaching and learning, engaging us in scholarship and really pushing the north of African thought in our teaching and learning. And it's very difficult actually to really separate teaching and learning and, and research. As uh, our dean always challenge our colleagues who says they love teaching, they don't love research. They'll ask them the books that we're prescribing in class, who wrote them? I want to prescribe other people's books for how long? You know, that's the message in our faculty. Um, Mr. Ratao, thank you very much for your wonderful review. I also got interested in reading Ben Oakley from you. <laughs> I know how you love him so much and how he inspire you. Uh, you see, our faculty is very diverse and very interesting. And we make it an effort that we know everything that happens in all the departments, in all the... I remember even, uh, the other day, Professor Masoka, we with someone from um, creative, is it creative arts or African languages. They even ask me, in which field are you? Because it's like, we, we know everything that is happening in our faculty. Um, our esteemed guest, Advocate Mugosi, uh, from the National Council of Arts. Thank you for taking time in your busy schedule uh, to provide a response. And I like especially how you address the historical imbalances of indigenous knowledges and the culture, and also motivating us to take a stand and revisit our roots and not forget where we come from. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Dr. Pome. Uh, thank you for having the conversation with the author. Uh, and actually assisting in making this reality a reality in the faculty. As we already said that um, the webinars actually when we work behind the scenes with Dr. Pum, especially to launch the books, we have lots of books in the faculty that we still go to. Shine, we shine in our faculty. Like you said, the only person who will start is the dean <laughs> by fire, by force. And we're saying, our dean and mentor, Professor Masoka, congratulations on this day, and especially on your quest to advance African thoughts. You continue to demonstrate scholarship in your thinking, in your theory especially with the Afrocense approaches to research in and within the local communities. And also we've heard, especially from the books that were presented, that you, you offer insights and possibilities for us actually to dismantle and decolonize uh, the discourses which are there by enhancing research, community engagement, knowledge production in institutions across Africa, and especially encouraging us and motivating us to do it, especially here at the University of Sudan in a rural-based university. And we, we also challenge actually uh, CMD to make sure that these webinars, uh, I think the, our VC has started the right platform of um, engaging scholarship with the webinars, if it can be broadcast throughout the wider community, also externally. So in this regard, so, so it, therefore that these webinars will showcase talent in the whole of the province, nation and internationally to give you the, the visibility and recognition. And we can say that we have come a long way and this is the time for us to attract attendees and particip participants from wider community and society. And it can only happen through your marketing. But we think we know you're doing a great job, Sister Nine or Team. Um, and all the organizers behind the scenes, this event won't, won't be possible without you. Although I cannot mention all of you by name, 
um, for taking your time and resources to make sure that everything is flawless today. Our program director, Dr. Kwele, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you that when we're planning this, we didn't even tell her this. We just put her because she's, we know she's a soldier. <laughs> She'll see the program in the morning and she'll run with it. Thank you very much. And I just want to say yes, thank you for allowing me an opportunity to deliver a vote of thanks for such an honorable event. And to the wonderful audience, thank you for participating and attending. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. um, colleagues, I don't want to spoil the moment. We are done.